is what you're saying to us here today. I do not believe, I did not do anything wrong that was not in the interest in all the time that I worked for Enron Corporation that was in the interest of the shareholders of the company. In the Titanic, the captain went down with the ship. In Enron, it looks to me like uh, the captain first gave himself and some friends a bonus, then lowered himself and the top folks down in the lifeboat, and then hollered up and said, by the way, everything's going to be just fine. Enron was an energy, commodities, and service company that employed 29,000 people and generated $101 billion of revenue at its height. However, due to massive amounts of accounting fraud, it was forced to declare bankruptcy and became the largest company in the world to do so at the time. As a result, its stock price plummeted from $90 to $0.12 cents in a matter of weeks. To make matters worse, when the dust settled, the CEO was sentenced to 24 years in prison, the founder and chairman died of a heart attack, and an executive shot himself in the head. This is the rise and fall of Enron. Before I get into the video, I just want to say I have braces. Just in case you thought they were grills. Heh <laughs> heh. Sorry, I'm cringe. Also, a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Magic Spoon. I've been trying to cut down on unhealthy food and realized I basically can't eat anything anymore. So I tried to find foods that taste good and are healthy and thankfully I found Magic Spoon. It's amazing. There's zero grams of sugar, 13 grams of protein, and only four net grams of carbs in each serving for a total of 140 calories. Try Magic Spoon's best-selling flavors in a four-flavor variety pack featuring cocoa, fruity, frosted, and peanut butter. Or try their other popular flavors like cookies and cream, maple waffle, cinnamon, and blueberry. My personal favorite is peanut butter. I just love how it tastes like a regular cereal but is super nutritious. Oh, by the way, Magic Spoon is keto-friendly, soy-free, gluten-free, grain-free, and low-carb. Click the link below to grab a variety pack and try it today. And be sure to use the promo code InternetAJ at checkout to get $5 off any order. Or go to magicspoon.com slash internetaj. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's back with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, you can refund it, no questions asked. So click the link below and use the code internetaj for $5 off, or go to magicspoon.com slash internetaj to save $5. Now back to the video. Enron was founded by a man named Kenneth Lay. Lay grew up in a poor family, but worked his way up and earned a PhD in economics from the University of Houston. He created Enron in 1985 by merging two companies, Houston Natural Gas and Internor. And well, Lay had an interesting philosophy. He wanted to become a leader in energy by exploiting the fact that it was unregulated. Unlike many other commodities at the time, the government didn't control the price of natural gas. Ken Lay showed his concerning moral compass early on when Enron became involved in what was later called the Valhalla Scandal of 1987. It all unraveled when two rogue traders were discovered to be gambling company money on oil prices. Oil prices were quite volatile, which made that kind of investing extremely risky. In addition, the traders diverted funds into personal and offshore accounts. One of the accounts was audaciously called M. Yass or My Ass. When Lay found out what they were doing, instead of punishing them, he just told them to continue. He only cared that the two traders were making Enron tons of money and ignored the potential repercussions. The decision came to buy Enron in the ass when the traders inevitably made a mistake and lost $90 million. Consequently, one of the traders went to jail and the other was fired. Forced to find a new way to make money after losing his cash cows, Lay hired a man named Jeffrey Skilling as CEO. Skilling held a Darwinian philosophy and believed that fear and money were the only things that motivated people. Notably, he only accepted the position on the condition that he could use mark-to-market accounting at Enron. This was a sly move because it meant the company could claim future unrealized profits on a deal even if it didn't make a single dollar. It meant Enron could use a projection as a real number in its books. And the amount of profits were completely subjective. Skilling was so arrogant that after everything was approved by the SEC, he memed the potential absurdity of mark-to-market accounting in a promotional video. Hypothetical future value accounting. Whoa! If we do that, we can add a gazillion dollars to the bottom line. Whoa, Jeff! All right, that sounds fantastic. Oh, Jeff, thank you. That's just superb performance. And you're gonna go far, my boy. Probably president of the company one day. You think so? I th Sadly, this type of accounting would lead to the eventual downfall of Enron. Skilling ran the company with an iron fist. He quickly instituted a policy where employees were rated 1 to 5, with 5 being the worst. He then mandated that 10% had to be a 5 and would be fired. Naturally, this resulted in a make money at all costs or die attitude. And boy did Enron make money. It poured in as a result of the greedy, work intense culture that Skilling cultivated. Now as CEO at one of the top companies in the world, Skilling's attitude began to change. He transformed from a nerdy guy with glasses to an adventurous risk taker. He soon became known for taking other executives and customers on dangerous motorbike trips where people sometimes broke bones. Lou Pai, the head of the EES division at Enron, thrived in this environment. He was infamous for having an addiction to strippers. He often visited clubs with employees and charged the company card. Interestingly, he ended up getting a divorce from his wife so he could marry his stripper girlfriend who had his child. 
And in order to finance the divorce, he left the company and sold his entire stock portfolio worth $250 million. Notably, Pai would become the only executive to walk away with a significant amount of cash. In the late 1990s, the entire stock market was doing extremely well. Naturally, Enron was profiting just like everyone was. In fact, in July 1999, Enron's stock was worth a whopping $42 a share. That year, Enron teamed up with none other than Blockbuster. Executives wanted to create a video on-demand service and chose Blockbuster because of their well-known name. Mind you, this was years before Netflix and Hulu. The idea was truly groundbreaking. Sadly though, the deal fell apart mainly because Blockbuster didn't have any sense of urgency. By the year 2000, executives lost interest and decided to stick with physical stores rather than an online service, a move that ended up killing their business later on. Imagine if Enron and Blockbuster actually went through with it. Both companies could have been thriving today. In January of 2000, Enron's stock was worth $68 a share. However, it wasn't making any profits at all. Instead, Enron was losing money and manipulating the numbers so their stock price would go up. For example, Enron lost nearly $1 billion by building a power plant in India. Sadly, Indians couldn't afford the power the plant produced, making it a colossal failure. But instead of marking it as a loss, Enron used mark-to-market accounting to make it look like it made a sizable profit. In an attempt to salvage their terrible finances, Enron stepped into the deregulated energy market of California. Traders at Enron then falsely increased the demand for power by deliberately turning off electricity grids whenever they wanted. Hey, uh, this is David up at Enron. Uh-huh. There's not much uh, demand for power at all. And if we shut it down, could you bring it back up in three or four hours? Oh, yeah. Why don't you just go ahead and shut her down then, if that's okay? I want you guys to get a little creative okay. and come up with a reason to go down. This skyrocketed the cost of electricity and unfairly gouged the citizens of California. Oh, I can't help myself. You know what the difference is between the state of California and the Titanic? <laughs> This is being webcast. I know I'm going to regret this. But at least when the Titanic went down, the lights were on. It didn't take long before citizens got extremely upset with Enron. The public pressure was intense, and one woman even threw a blueberry pie at Skilling. He visibly started to crumble under the pressure, and the stock began to decline. In another odd move, Enron didn't release its earnings report and tried to keep it hidden. When an analyst asked about it in April 2001, Skilling replied by calling him an asshole. You're the only financial institution that can't produce a balance sheet or a cash flow statement with their earnings. <laughs> well, you, 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 well uh, thank you very much. We appreciate, appreciate it. it. Asshole. It was clear he wasn't handling the stress well and eventually resigned from Enron on August 14, 2001. Now, this was a major red flag to the public. Typically, CEOs didn't quit without warning because it could result in a downgrade of the stock or negative media attention. But Skilling didn't care and tried to play it off by saying he just wanted to focus on his family. Ken Lay then took over as CEO but couldn't escape the intense scrutiny. All eyes were on Enron, including the SEC, and it didn't take long for them to uncover the series of massive financial scams Enron conducted. The corruption was so bad that the chief financial officer, Andrew Fastow, paid himself an extra $48 million by taking it from Enron. Essentially, a thief stole from the thieves. Is it your contention that you knew of it and it was appropriate? Arthur Anderson and our lawyers had taken a very hard look at this structure and they believed it was appropriate. But if the theory is that Fastow went rogue somewhere deep in the jungles of Enron, and was the sole agent of the apocalypse, I just don't buy it. With nowhere else to turn, Enron declared bankruptcy in December 2001. Its stock price plummeted from about $90 to just 12 cents in a matter of weeks. When the dust settled, many people at Enron were charged with significant financial crimes. Fasta was sentenced to six years in prison and was forced to forfeit $24 million in assets. He was released in 2011. Cliff Baxter, an executive at Enron who cashed out about $30 million of stock, killed himself in his Mercedes. His suicide note was addressed to his wife and read, Carol, I am so sorry for this. I feel I just can't go on. I have always tried to do the right thing, but where there was once great pride, now it's gone. I love you and the children so much. I just can't be any good to you or myself. The pain is overwhelming. Please try to forgive me. Cliff. Ken Lay was found guilty of fraud and conspiracy, but died of a heart attack before his sentencing. Jeffrey Skilling was sentenced to 24 years in prison, but was released early on February 21st, 2019. He is currently trying to launch an online oil and gas platform called Veld LLC. Additionally, Arthur Anderson, the accounting firm responsible for auditing Enron, was convicted of obstruction of justice. Ultimately, Enron was a story of corporate greed of astronomically large proportions. Enron was the seventh largest company in the United States at its peak. Many people lost their jobs, life savings, or 401ks due to its closure. 
The story was so insane it was featured in the 2005 movie Enron The Smartest Guys in the Room. I personally think it was an incredibly well done movie so make sure to check it out if you're interested. Thankfully, new laws have since been put in place to try to stop people from doing what Enron did. However, as we saw with Theranos, corporate greed and fraud seems to always seep through. Thanks so much for watching. See you in the next one.